All right, here we are again. Um, we're going to go right into it. We've got a lot to do today. Um, just a little bit of review of what we did last time, taking a look at the computer. Um, now, one thing I should point out is you, you have a lot of slides here in this PowerPoint uh, chapter uh, in regards to chapter 23 that I don't really go over, okay? But looking at that, we talked about uh, flexible budgets and fixed and static budgets, right? And they walk you through an example in your slides. Um, I chose to go through the lawn mowing example as opposed to the one uh, that they did in here, but that, that's another one uh, you can go through if you'd like in the PowerPoints. But the whole idea of a flexible budget is if you can tell me what your, your activity was for the period, I can tell you what your cost should have been, okay? This is in regards to a flexible budget, okay? Um, and then, I, then we went through that example as far as the uh, lawn mowing company, okay? Now, let's go ahead and take a look at that, uh, at the uh, chimney example, okay? And that was this one right here, okay? Now, I'm not going to go ahead, I'm not going to read through that whole thing, okay? That would take a little while to do, and I, I know you've already read it, hopefully. So, let's go ahead and go through that and take a look at it, though, okay? All right, I will hit on some high points here. Um, okay, Bruce prepared a fixed budget for the upcoming four-month period of November, December, January, and February, right? He estimated a business will service a total of 60 chimneys during that period. And he's doing a budget for that four-month period as a whole, right? Okay, so this is the budget he comes up with. Uh, and this is a fixed budget, to, it's at one activity level for that four month period, okay? And this is at 60 chimneys, okay? Now the first thing that we need to do is go through each one of these line items and decide if it is fixed or if it is variable, okay? In regards to the number of chimneys that he services, okay? Revenue would be what? Variable. Variable, okay. Labor would be? Variable. Variable. Advertising on billboards would be? Fixed. Fixed. Cleaning solvent supplies expense? Variable. Would be variable, yeah. The, he would use more of that for the more chimneys that he, he services. Equipment rent? Fixed. That would be fixed. Okay, good. Now, for the items that are variable, the next step is to figure out and use this fixed budget to figure out for the variable items what the cost per chimney would be or what, what the amount per chimney should be because we're going to have to do this for revenue as well. In other words, if he estimates a total of 13200 of revenue for 60 chimneys, basically what is, he, um, what is he budgeting per chimney? What revenue amount? 220 per chimney. 220, right? 220, which is just the 13,200 divided by the 60, okay? Labor is $3,600 for 60 chimneys. So what's $3,600 divided by 60? 60. Is it 60? Yeah. Um, we don't do this for advertising or equipment rental because those are fixed. Cleaning solvent. He estimated a total of $480 for 60 chimneys. So what is he basically estimating per chimney? Eight dollars. Eight bucks, right? Eight dollars, correct? Okay, now we're gonna use this information um, to prepare our flexible budget, okay? Now at the end of the four month period, the actual amounts that he realized were as follows. Now, he serviced a total of 72 chimneys, right? So, we cannot compare, at least meaningfully, we can't compare the actual to this fixed budget because the activity levels are different, right? This is 60 chimney activity level. This is 72 chimney activity level. So, what we have to do 
is prepare a flexible budget. Okay? So, let's do that. All right. Okay, let's take a look at that. Okay, so what we're going to do is we are going to prepare a flexible budget for Bruce's A plus chimney sweep for that four month period. Okay, now, let's see, can you see that in the back? Can you see that, Matt? Okay. All right, now, the first thing we, wanted to, we need to do is I wanted you to use that format that was uh, specified in the textbook. And I want you to use the contribution margin method where we have our revenues less our variable costs equals our contribution margin less our fixed costs equals our net income. Correct? All right, so we're going to have our flexible budget and we're going to have our actual amounts here, right? And what level of activity will those be at? Well, our actual was 72 chimneys, so we need to flex our budget at 72 chimneys, don't we? Okay? Now, you told me correctly that the per unit amounts for the items that were variable in regards to the activity were 220 for revenue, 60 for labor, and 8 for cleaning solvent, right? Okay? So 220 times 72 is what? 15,840? Is that right? 60 times 72 is 43.20. 8 times 72 is 5.76. We add those together, total variable cost of 4.896. We subtract that from revenue and we get a contribution margin of 10,944. Right? Okay, now we put our fixed cost amounts. Now, these amounts of 900 for advertising and 3000 for equipment rental, that's the same as on the fixed budget at 60 chimneys, right? But it shouldn't matter because they're fixed costs. They don't change in regards to this difference in activity level. Okay? So our total fixed cost of 3900. Thus our net income would be the 10,944 minus the 3900. We have a net income of 7044. Cool? You guys get that? Yeah. Now we're going to compare that to our actual amounts, right? These actual amounts were given as these so that we can figure up meaningful variances, okay? Well, we figure out the difference between each line item and that equals these numbers here, but then we also have to specify, and don't forget to do this, we have to specify it's favorable or unfavorable. Right? Well, our actual amount was 14,255. Our flexible budget for that activity was 15,840. So that's unfavorable, right? Is that correct? Okay. Labor, our flexible budget at that activity level is 4320. Actual was less, so that's favorable. Cleaning solvent, the actual was a lot more than the flexible budget amount. Correct? So that's unfavorable. That nets out to an unfavorable total variable difference between these two. Okay. Now we compare these amounts. Was that favorable or unfavorable? unfavorable. Well, what is it? Unfavorable. It's unfavorable. I agree. And why is that? Well, contribution margin, we would like, we would like all things being equal to be high. Well, we should have had 10,944 at this activity level. We only had 9176. So that's the 1768 and favorable. Our actual costs for the, the fixed items were greater, so these are all unfavorable, right? And our flexible budget, we should have had 7,044 net income at that activity level. We had 5224. That's an 1820, highly unfavorable, isn't it? Okay. Now remember, we talked about this last time. Just because they're fixed cost doesn't mean we'll never have variances. Fixed cost doesn't mean 100% predictable, right? Okay? So how many people got that answer? Did you get something like that? Okay? Good. It's an important concept and you'll come back to that in managerial accounting. Daniel? I did everything, but I didn't put down any of the variances. 
Like I put unfavorable, unfavorable, and all that, but I didn't put down any variance. You didn't put looking at the screen. You didn't put these numbers. Mm -hmm. So what what'd you do? Did yours look like? Um, I just like compared them and decide if they're unfavorable or not. Yeah. Um, so you did something like uh, this. Yeah. Yeah. You don't want to do that. I mean, wouldn't you agree that uh, having the numbers there? Yeah. So have the numbers there. Notice these are all positive numbers. Okay. We let. We have always had the number be positive, and then we, we, we use the unfavorable and favorable. Cool? Okay. Now, this is where somebody usually poses a question and says, well, Dave, this is all good and fine, but we can see how a flexible budget is more meaningful than a fixed or static budget. However, a flexible budget you can only do at the end of the period, right? So it's not very, it doesn't seem very meaningful. Well, I understand where you're coming from, but that's not the case. Take a look at this screen. Um, do you see where if you set up your per unit amounts, you could come in at the end of each day during this four month period and you could update your activity level as far as what it has been so far, right? And these, these numbers could change every day based on how many chimneys you serviced that day and thus how many chimneys you've serviced in total, right? And these amounts, everything in the actual column, of course, will just be input from what your actual accounting records are, right? Okay? So a flexible budget is not something that you have to wait until the end of the period to do. You can easily prepare it as you go along consistently and regularly updating your activity level and to again tell you what your flexible budget amounts should be at that activity level. Again, very easy to do with Excel if you understand Microsoft Excel. Okay, so I wanted to make sure I got that point across. All right, questions on that folks? Questions on that? Okay, we're going to go over some new stuff today. And this is kind of the, the last major topic um, that we're going, to, uh, we're going to cover in this class, okay? Now, we've talked about fixed budgets kind of comparing apples and oranges. So we talked about the concept of flexible budgets, which we pre prepared for Bruce's Chimney Company, right? Okay. We still have a little bit of a problem. And um, not so much a problem, but we can do better. We can do better. So what I want to do is take a look at the computer. We're going we're gonna to switch gears here a little bit. And we are going to change topics. Oops. Come off that for a second if you would. Hit the wrong button. OK, there we are. We're going we're gonna to switch topics here and we're going to talk about standard costs. And we're going to point out that even when we have an overage, even when we have an overage or an unfavorable variance, it could be a price problem or it could be a quantity problem. Let me restate that. Even when we do a flexible budget, we still have the question of, is this a price problem or a quantity problem? Let me show you an example on the one that we just did. Okay? Now, this is a flexible budget, right? The activity levels are the same. Flexible and actual amounts, same activity level. Let's take a look, for example, at the cleaning solvent line. Now we have a $258 unfavorable variance there for in regards to cleaning solvent, right? Now we know that since these activity levels are the same, this is not due to a difference in activity level, right? Now I want you to understand this concept because this is important. That $258 unfavorable variance for the cleaning solvent cost could be a price problem 
or it could be a quantity problem. What do I mean by that? Well, come off that if you would. It could be a situation where the cleaning solvent has gone up in price since we made our flexible budget, right? Maybe there's some raw material in it that is in short supply, and so the cleaning solvent has gone up in price. Wouldn't that cause, cause an unfavorable variance, right? Okay. Or maybe the price didn't change. What else could have happened to cause an unfavorable variance? Took more to do the cleaning. You're using more of it than what you should have or what you budgeted per chimney. You see, very key here. It could be a price problem. Cleaning solvent has, is more expensive. Or maybe it's not a price problem. You are just using more of it than what you should per chimney. Either one of those would cause an unfavorable variance in regards to that line item for the cost of cleaning solvent. Are you with me? So, we can do better. We can do better looking at this. That's great. Well, that's not great, but that's great that we know that we have a $258 unfavorable variance in regards to cleaning solvent, cleaning solvent, but what can we do to ascertain if it is a price problem or if it is instead a quantity problem? Now, I want you to know that this is a concept that we often encounter. For example, uh, let me give you an example. Um, okay, for example, let's say my wife and I, we look at how much um, we've been eating out and uh, we have a, you know, for our personal budget. And our, we are going way over budget in regards to uh, eating out at restaurants, okay? Now, to lower or to try to meet our budget that we set for ourselves in regards to eating out, we could do one of two things or both. What are they? Do you know where I'm getting at? Go out less. We could go out less, and that would be addressing the quantity problem. Okay? Or what else could we do? Cheaper restaurants. We could go to cheaper <laughs> restaurants. Right? Pizza Hut. Which is a price, attacking it from the price side. Does that make sense? Either way, we could lower the amount that we are um, spending on eating out. Either eat out less, quantity, or go to cheaper places. Price, go to Taco Bell, get their value menu, okay? Um, here's another example. Has anybody here ever worked at a restaurant? Okay. Has anybody ever been in the situation where the boss said, hey, we are slower than what we thought we would be tonight. I need to send a few people home. Anybody ever been in that situation? Okay. Well, that manager is trying to control their labor costs by attacking which of those factors, price or quantity? Quantity. quantity. Fewer hours being worked. And that makes more sense than saying, hey, we're a little slow tonight. Everybody stays here, but I'm going to lower everybody's pay rate by 20%. Right? Now, that'd be a weird way of attacking the price problem. Okay? No. The manager says we're going to attack the quantity side of it. Okay? This whole idea comes to manage, there's a concept called management by exception. Have you ever heard that in any of your classes? Management by exception recognizes that we have a finite amount of time and other resources are also finite. And so when we attack a problem, we really want to, really want to drill in on where the problem actually is. Okay? We really want to focus on where the problem is because that's where we can do the most good. Correct? Right? Um, okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to address this concept of standard costs. Okay? Now, we need to introduce the concept of standards. What is a standard? Okay? Well, a standard is like a budget for one item of output. Okay? It's almost best illustrated by just doing an example. So let's say that we produce these bookshelves over here. It's a very simple item. There's really only one material. 
and that's uh, plywood, right? Okay. A standard for this bookshelf might be, in regards to direct materials, that every bookshelf we produce should use 30 square feet of plywood. 30 square feet of plywood per bookshelf. You with me? And that that plywood should cost 50 cents per square foot. You with me? This is a quantity standard. This is a price standard. You with me? Now that is in regards to direct materials. Now what we're also going to find out is there are standards in regards to direct labor as well. So for this bookshelf we might say each bookshelf should take 1.5 hours to manufacture. Okay? And we should be paying our manufacturer labor a standard rate of $20 per hour. Are you with me? Now this is the quantity side of it, but with labor we don't really, we, we use hours. That's how we measure the quantity, right? And this is the price part of it, but with labor we say, we don't say what's your price per hour, we say what's your rate per hour. Okay? Are you with me? But that is an example of standards for direct materials and direct labor. Now, there are also some standards in regards to overhead, but we don't cover them in this class. That's what you'll do. You'll do some of that in managerial accounting. Okay? Everybody understand what the, what the idea of standards is in that example? Um, think of coming off that a little bit. Let's think of some more standards. Now, when I worked at Pizza Hut, I worked at Pizza Hut. I've talked to you about Pizza Hut before, haven't I? Worked at Pizza Hut. I'm so glad I worked there because it's given me so many class examples. Has anybody ever worked at a pizza place? You have? Where'd you guys work? I worked at Square Pizza over in Independence. Okay. I was at Emo's on Overland Park. Okay. Well, when I was at Pizza Hut, we had standards per pizza in regards to materials. And I still remember some of these over 30 years later. Like, I remember back then, a large pepperoni pizza should have 36 pepperonis. A medium should have 24 pepperonis. And a small should have 12 pepperonis. Right? Have you guys, did you guys have standards like that at all? Or sometimes it's by weight? It was yeah. Just, yeah, we had it by, because our pepperonis were pretty big. Slices, yeah. So we had it usually a three by three or two by two or something like that. Okay. Toppings like cheese and stuff were by weight, but pepperoni, we, uh, it wasn't like quantity. It was just, you had to have like a finger spathed length. Yeah. Length in between each. Okay. But it sounds like there were some quantity standards there, right? I mean, aren't recipes that way? When you look at a recipe, isn't it giving you a quantity standard? Okay. So you've, you've seen the concepts of standards before. Uh, those are kind of in regards to materials. There's also um, standards in regards to labor. Now, I don't know if, um, if you've ever been in this situation, but like when I was an auditor at a public accounting firm, they would tell me, for this specific audit that you're working on, it should take 40 total hours. Okay? It should take 40 total hours. Right? So that's kind of a labor standard for that audit. Right? Okay? So we come across these standards in life. And like I said, it's kind of the budget for one unit. Now, think about this. Let's ask, um, let, let's address some standard things. Some, uh, some items in regards to standards. How do we get these standards? Well, they are based on carefully predetermined amounts. We'll talk about that more in a second. Like I said, we use these for labor and material and overhead, although we'll mainly just talk about labor and material. It's kind of an expected level of performance, right? And we use these as benchmarks, okay? Now let's drill down a little bit more. Let's ask a few questions in regards to these standard costs or these standards. First of all, where do these standards come from? Okay? Where do these standards come from? Well, think about it. Come off that for a second. Where do you think they came up with the standard of 36 pepperonis per large pepperoni pizza? Customers. Perhaps. Customer surveys. 
I bet one of their chefs just kind of made a pizza and observed how it was like till it was you know looked nice and tasted good and you just counted how many you put on there I think you're exactly right I mean can't you see a situation where maybe they tried making one with 48 maybe they tried making one with 40 36 25 they said this is too these these aren't enough and you can have too much pepperoni on a pizza can't you and it gets all kind of greasy right so I think you're exactly right Blake you probably had a chef there who said this is a good standard. And they used to tell us that. They say, we have these standards, not because we're cheap, but we have, we have ascertained that this, this makes the most tasty pizza quantities in these amounts. And we want that if you go to a pizza hut in Omaha versus Kansas City versus Miami, you know what to expect. They're all using the same standards, right? Okay. So in answer to this question, in regards to materials for food, it might be a chef. For other items, um, like bookshelves, it might be engineers or production managers, right? For, I, for standards in regards to costs, who would you want to talk to there? Accountants. Accountants, right? Maybe somebody in purchasing, correct? Good. What about in regards to labor? What if you wanted information about what standard labor rates should be? Where would you go? An efficiency expert. You might go to efficiency experts, but as far that probably be more for quantity. But for for rates, you might talk to human resources, or maybe look at industry periodicals as far as what the standard rates for people are. Right. Now, as far as how long it should take. Like, example, it said, what was it, uh, how many hours to make that bookshelf? Hour and a half. Hour and a half. Where do you think uh, we got that standard of it should take an hour and a half to make a bookshelf? Probably number of hours worked divided by number of cases made. Perhaps. But there was some sort of observation of workers making these things, right? Okay. And you're right. That's sometimes we get into the efficiency experts and say this, this would be easier if you did this. But it's some sort of observation of people doing what they do and seeing how long it should take. Make sense? Okay. Now, so the answer to that first question, accountants, engineers, purchasing departments, supervisors, etc. Okay. Now let's ask another question. What is the difference between practical versus ideal standards? This is a concept I want you to understand. Okay. Um, well, ideal standards are based on perfection, okay? They are very difficult to attain, and thus they're usually discouraging, okay, to employees, because they're very difficult to attain, all right? Practical standards are attainable with reasonable effort and efficiency. They're not easy to attain, but with reasonable effort and efficiency, you can attain it. Now, let me give you an example of practical versus ideal standards um, in regards to materials for, one of the things I can do is I can do ceramic tiling. Has anybody ever done that? You lay ceramic tiling like in a bathroom or a kitchen or whatever. Okay. I learned how to do that about 15, 20 years ago and kept helping out friends and stuff like that. Um, so uh, I know how to do that. Okay. Well, let me give you an example. Let's take a look at a very simple, let's say we have a square room right here. And it is 10 foot by uh, 10 foot. You with me? Okay. And so each one of these tiles is the standard size for a tile. And so it is about one foot. It's a little less, actually. Right? So how many tiles do you have here? You got 10 tiles, right? In that row. And how many tiles do you have here? 10. OK. So let's say we have a room that is 100 square feet. OK? Just like this room. OK? It is 10 by 10, it is 100 square feet. Now our tiles are a little smaller than one foot by one foot, okay? Now, if we were going to say we're going to use an ideal standard, 
how many tiles would I go buy? 100. I would go buy 100 tiles, right? Now, could you tile that room with 100 tiles? Mm -hmm. It's possible, but it would be extremely difficult. Why? Well, because every now and then you break a tile or you cut it wrong, right? And so you end up throwing it away. Or maybe you get a tile and it's got some weird coloration on it and you're like, I don't want to use this one, right? So an ideal standard based on perfection, very, very, very hard to attain and plus discouraging would be to go buy 100 tiles for this laundry room or whatever, right? A practical standard that I developed for myself was I always bought, I always figured up the square footage, in this case it's 100 square feet, and I multiply, and I, and I got 10% extra. So multiply that times 1.10, I would go buy 110 tiles, okay? So 10% of 100 tiles is 10 tiles, I'd buy 10 plus the 100, 110 tiles. That's a practical standard, you with me? That allows for some tiles breaking or some miscuts or some ones that are kind of ugly and you don't want to use them or whatever, right? Okay, does that give you an idea? That's in regards to practical versus ideal standards for materials. What about labor? Well, think back to that hour and a half per bookshelf, right? Okay, let's say that you five are my bookshelf assemblers, right? And I have watched all of you make bookshelves. And for you four, you know, sometimes it's about 1.6 hours, sometimes it's one, about 1.4 hours, okay? So I come up with 1.5 hours, okay? Now, let's say, though, that I have Jeremiah as a, as also as a bookshelf assembler, and for some reason, God has given him the gift of assembling bookshelves. He is the LeBron James of bookshelf assemblers. And nobody knows how he does it, but this guy can build a bookshelf, and it's a good bookshelf, in one hour. Okay? But he is the LeBron James of bookshelf assemblers. Well, if I use that one hour based on perfection, perfection is Jeremiah in this case, right? That would be an ideal standard, but a practical standard would be about an hour and a half. Does that make sense? It allows for, you know, again, maybe you might make a cut in, in the plywood wrong and you have to go back and do it, or, you know, maybe something doesn't fit right, or, you know, whatever. Okay, things happen. You understand the concept? So when we develop standards, folks, we use the concept of practical standards, okay? Now, back to the slides. Let's address the concept of a standard cost card. What is a standard cost card? Well, a standard cost card might look like this. This is for a specific item that we produce, and it is saying, now there, it, it's for simplistic purposes, we only have one raw material. But they're saying for each item we produce, we should use one kilogram of raw material and our st standard price should be $25 per kilogram for a total standard cost in regards to direct materials of $25. In regards to direct labor, it should take two hours to produce one item. We should be paying a standard rate of $20 per hour and our standard cost should be $40 uh, in regards to direct labor. Make sense? Now here is for, for variable MOH, but we're not going to really talk about that in this class. But know that that is on the standard cost card. And you have one of these standard cost cards that's unique for each item you produce. Are you with me? And we are going to use those to compute variances. We're going to do an example here in a second. Okay? As a matter of fact, Jeremiah, why don't you um, pass one of these out to everybody while I'm going through this? Thank you. We're going to do an example here, folks, because it's going to be best to learn it that way. But this is when you get to your slides. And again, I'm not going to go through all these slides. But we are going to be addressing the concepts that you see on these slides that I'm going through, OK? Where we figure out, um, using these brackets, 
what our price variance is and what our quantity variance is. Okay? Um, now, let's take a look at this example. But before we do that, let's talk a little bit on a little higher level. Here's what we're going to do. First of all, we're only going to talk about direct materials right now. So this is all in regards to direct materials. Are you with me? Okay, it's all in regards to direct materials. So forget labor for a second. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to figure out a number and we're going to calculate it and put it right there. We're going to calculate another number and we're going to put it right here. We're going to calculate another number and we're going to put it right here. Okay, the difference between these two numbers is going to be called the price variance in regards to direct materials. And the difference between these two numbers will be called the quantity variance. Okay, you with me? Okay, now how do we calculate these numbers that go in these bubbles? Well, this number will be the actual quantity times the actual price paid. The actual quantity purchased and used times the actual price paid. This bubble will be the standard quantity that we should have used times the standard price that we should have paid. And this bubble will be the actual quantity times the standard price. Are you with me? Okay. Now, if you go back to the slides, this is the same thing that the slide is saying. Okay. The standard price is the amount that should have been paid per our standard cost car card for the resources acquired. And the standard quantity is the quantity that should have been used for the actual good output. Okay. Now, they also sometimes talk about these, these formulas right here. I don't really use these. That's a different way of coming up with the answer. But what I like to use is this bracket method. Okay, I just think it's easier. Easier to visualize, easier to see. So let's come off that for a second and let's talk about this specific example I gave you. And we're going to just solve this. Okay? I'm going to highlight some things as we go through this because this is, this is a, we're going to work through this whole example eventually. But right now, today, again, we're just going to focus on direct materials. So I'm going to focus the information we need, uh, or highlight the information we need for direct materials. Okay, XYZ company manufactures tables. A standard cost card for the manufacture of one table shows the following. This is the standard cost card. Okay, so for every table we should use four square feet of um, lumber and we should be paying a standard price of $3 per square foot for a total of 12. Now in regards to direct labor, it should take two hours per table, and we should be paying $8 an hour for a total of 16, okay? Um, in November, the company produced 1,000 tables. Actual production took 2,300 direct labor hours and 3,900 square feet of lumber. The lumber cost $12.90 while the worker's average pay was $7.80 per hour. What we're going to do is calculate the price and quantity variances for direct materials. We are just working on direct materials right now. Okay? So let me highlight the information for, that we need to do our direct materials. Okay, we need to know that we manufacture tables. Okay? We need to know our direct material standards on our cost card, right? We do need to know that we produced 1,000 tables. Actual production took, okay, well I'm, I'm not going to highlight the labor part, but it took 3,900 square feet of lumber. The lumber cost 12,090. Okay, the stuff I didn't highlight is in regards to direct labor. We can ignore it for now. Are you with me? So I'm going to use that information to figure out the price and quantity variances in regards to direct material. Okay? All right. Now, um, 
we need to identify some items here, okay? We need to identify actual quantity, actual price, standard quantity, and standard price from this information up here. Because aren't those the, item, the variables we need down here? Okay. Let me, let me see how we get these, and I will do the easiest ones first and go to the more difficult ones. Okay. Um, the standard price. What's the standard price? Anybody want to guess? Standard price is $3 a square foot. Okay. $3 per square foot. You with me? Okay. Um, the actual quantity is pretty, how much actual lumber did we utilize? Uh, 3,900 square feet. 3,900 square feet. Very good. Okay, those two are pretty easy, okay? These other ones, a little trickier. Actual price. Well, it doesn't say the actual price we paid per square foot. But it does tell us that the lumber cost $12.090, right? Well, whenever you purchase something, what you get charged is the actual quantity you purchased times the actual price, right? So actual quantity times actual price equals $12.090. Okay. Now, do we know our actual quantity? Yes. So 3,900 times our actual price equals 12,090. So thus our actual price equals, thank you. Our actual quantity times our actual price equals 12,090. We know our actual quantity is 3,900 square feet. So 3,900 times our actual price equals 12,090, right? Well, can we figure out our actual price? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we can. Just take 12,090. Divide by 3,900, and what is that? 310. $3.10? $3 is that correct? So now we know our actual price. $3.10 per square foot. Now our standard quantity. Now this is where students get mixed up. What do you think the most common thing that people say our standard quantity is? 4,000. That's the correct answer, Jeremiah. But a lot of times people will say, our standard quantity is four. <coughs> no, that's not, not quite all the way there. What they're saying is we should use four square feet of lumber for every table we produce. How many tables did we produce? A thousand, a thousand tables. So what is four times 1,000? 4,000 4, square feet. You with me? This tells us how much lumber we should have used per table that we produced. Well, we should use four square feet for every table produced. We actually produced a thousand tables. Four times thousand, we should have used four thousand square feet. Are you with me? So now we have all the items that we need to do our variances, okay? Okay, our actual quantity is 3,900 square feet. Our actual price is $3.10 per square foot. So somebody bang this out on a calculator. What's 3,900 times $3.10? 12,090. It's 12,090, and we knew that, didn't we? Yes. We knew that, okay, because it told us up here. Okay, our actual quantity is 3,900 square feet. What's our standard price? Three dollars. Three dollars per square foot. What's three times 3,900? I think it's 11,700. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Our standard quantity is what? 4,000. What's our standard price? Three dollars per square foot. This is 4,000 square feet, times $3 per square foot. Three times 4,000 is 12,000, okay? Now, the difference between these two numbers is $390. 
The difference between these two numbers is, forget my little mark that I did there accidentally, $300, correct? Now we have to decide if these are favorable or unfavorable. Let's take a look at the price variance. Do you think it's favorable or unfavorable? Favorable. It is unfavorable. Why would you, I agree with you, why would you say that? It cost you more than. Because our standard price was $3 per square foot and we paid $310. Right? Okay. All right, our quantity variance. Would you say that it's $300, would you say it's favorable or unfavorable? Unfavorable. Actually, it's favorable. Here's why. Because our standards allowed us, now these are practical standards. Our practical standards allowed us 4,000 square feet of lumber. And we only used 3,900. Now that doesn't mean we shorted them on lumber, that just means we were more efficient. Or going back to the tile example, maybe I allowed myself 110 tiles for that room and I only used 105. Does that make sense? So that is a favorable variance. Okay? Now, what, it would, what would be our total variance here? What's the net of those? $90 unfavorable. How do we get that? Well, 390 unfavorable, 300 favorable, nets out to 90 unfavorable, right? Or, thank you, I keep not scooting things up. 390 unfavorable, 300 favorable, nets out to $90 unfavorable, correct? Mm -hmm. Or, I want you to also understand, that's also the difference between that and that. Now, if you were looking, this is key, guys. If you were looking at a flexible budget, this is all you would know, the actual versus the standards. And you'd know we have a $90 unfavorable variance, like with that cleaning solvent. But do you see how doing this standard cost variance analysis, we can tell if it's a price problem or quantity problem? Does that make sense? And where is, where is the problem? It's on price. Now what title of, of person do you think is in, in regards to the price? If you had an unfavorable price variance, who do you think would you would want to go talk to first? Purchasing. Probably the purchasing people, right? Hey, what's, is it, are prices going up? Tell me what's going on, okay? If you had, now we have a favorable quantity variance, but let's say we had an unfavorable quantity variance in regards to direct materials. Where would you go there? That would mean what? That we're using more raw material than what we should be for that amount of output? You You'd probably go to like your production manager or your factory supervisor, right? This is another reason to do this sort of analysis because different people are different and different departments are in charge of these, correct? So this helps us hone in on that this is not a quantity problem. This is a price problem, isn't it? Okay, now we're going to talk more about interpretation of these um, later, okay? Um, and remember, we have just talked about direct material variances today, okay? So just focus on direct material variances. Um, any, any questions on that? Now, take a look back at this. One thing I want to point out is when you put your numbers in your bubbles, they should all be in the same ballpark. 12,090, 11,700, 12,000. Does that make sense? Here's what some students do. They, they use that four incorrectly, and they have 12,090, 11,700, and 12. Are those three numbers in the same ballpark? No. That usually means you made some sort of an error. Does that make sense? Okay. So I want you to look at this in your book, and I want you to... Uh, to, to work on this a little bit and do some homework for me, okay? So, what I want you to do, you wanna do some more handing out for me, Jeremiah? What I want you to do for homework, two things. Um, I want you to do two problems on this handout, okay? This is the direct materials the direct material variance problems. This is lecture number what, 239? Okay. 
and I have number one and number two. I want you to do both of those. Those are separate from each other, okay? And I want you to notice I have check figures at the bottom, okay? I've got check figures, so you can know if you're doing it correctly, all right? So, that's what I want you to do as homework. Um, one other thing, though, that I'm going to tell you. I'm not going to give you any more homework in regards to flexible budgets. However, if you want more practice, if you want more practice, see uh, exercise 23-2. You can do this one as extra practice. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a bonus video after lecture number 239 of me solving this problem. Are you with me? So I'm not going to do a homework check over this. We're not going to go over this in lecture on number 240. But if you want extra practice on flexible budgets, uh, do exercise 23.2. Follow the format of, of exhibit 23.3 in your book. Not, exa not exercise, but exhibit. So that's, you know, back a few pages. But if you want some extra practice in regards to flexible budgets, folks at home, do this one and I will make a video of me solving that. But for sure, I want you to do this, these two items on the direct material variance problems. Are you with me? Okay. One other item I'm going to give you, and we'll talk about it. I'm going to go ahead and give this to you today so you can start looking at it. But this is the study guide for the Accounting 2 final exam. We'll talk about more about that at the beginning of next class period, but I at least want you to know that it is out there. I'll hand it to you folks when the cameras are done. All right, any questions? I know I went a couple minutes over, but I needed to get all that in today, so, okay? See you guys next time. Do your homework. The only way to learn this stuff is by you doing it, okay? Take a look at those check figures at the bottom of that handout. It'll help you know if you're getting the right answers. Bye-bye.